announcement, and it is a, a difficult one. And the early hours of the morning last night, we went to the hospital and found out that we lost the baby. No. No. If I can, I'll be here to preach the gospel. If I cannot, I will go home and pray to the God that made the gospel possible. If such a thing as this had to happen, I am blessed to have my family around me. I am blessed to have my wife with a strong faith. I am blessed to have my son and my daughter. I am blessed to have my church family. And I would even be blessed that it is Lent. And we were promised that there would be suffering. And we were promised that there would be a Messiah that would come and suffer alongside of us. And there's no suffering that we can go through that Christ did not know. And as we celebrate Lent, we mourn and we repent. But we look forward to Easter, on which there will be a resurrection. We look forward to the hope of the gospel. We look forward to the day when Satan, who tempted Adam and Eve, who was a murderer and the father of lies from the beginning, will be taken down and it will be ugly. And that day will come and God's people will be vindicated and his glory will reign forever and ever. In the meantime, he is here with us in our suffering. So I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate being here with you. And I appreciate the only source of comfort Christ our Savior. And this is my only announcement. Before I have announcements this morning, I'd like to have us all pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. We do thank you for all our many blessings. Lord, we thank you for the pastor, his family. Thank you for sending them to us. We pray now that you would be with them, put your hand on them, guide them. And Lord, we know that they need your comfort and your care. And we do pray for that here this day. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Announcements this morning. Um, Monday, we have an elders meeting at 7. <coughs> and Thursday, it's trustees at 7. I think that's all I have for announcements this morning. Unless anyone else has any other. My heart is steadfast. O oh God, I will sing and make melody with all my being. Away from the heart and the land, I will away the God. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you, to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great among the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Now please stand for the prayer of invitation and the words. Please pray for that. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the great privilege that you have gathered us here into your house. And we thank you for the greater privilege that you have made us your house and that you have come to dwell inside all of your people. And so now we ask that you fill up this space and you fill up your people. And you bring us to worship you and look forward to the hope of Easter. We also ask that you be with us as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will give drink to my chosen people and the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise in the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now that we have been forgiven, we can have peace with God and each other. Share a sign of peace with your forgiven brothers and sisters in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We'll take a few minutes this morning and greet each other. And then when we get back to your seats, we'll stand and sing hymn number 315, where you were there.
Gracious God, we come before you now offering our gifts, which you first gave to us. Father, we pray that you would take these gifts, that you would use them here in the earthly kingdom. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs>
because your promises have always come true. We thank you that all good things come from you. Any material blessing that we have, any food or shelter or anything, all the people around us are all from you. So we thank you that any time we can say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And be dismissed. Thanksgiving to Michelle Redmond Sidley. Okay. Nobody here knows her as Michelle Redmond, I assume. Well, that's amazing. Okay. I'll go through her brain surgery while on Friday.
for George Papalka, who's in critical care and will unexpectedly after a routine operation. My sister-in-law's Aunt Bonnie that we had on the prayer chain, they discovered that she has cancer in the bones and the liver and she's 96. for Bonnie, who has cancer in her bones and her liver. to you in prayer. We thank you that though we cut off the line of communication when we sinned against you in the garden, uh, that you have opened it back up. And you care deeply about our difficulties and what we have to say and our joys. So we thank you uh, for uh, turning the, the deer to the side uh, so that it was not hit head on, uh, that everything is okay. We thank you that you brought Diane here uh, to be here with your saints. For my children and uh, the brain surgery on Friday, we thank you that that went well, and that we're even able to do something that complicated. We ask for uh, George uh, in the intensive care unit there for your hand to be with him and for them to be able to deal with this unexpectedly. So he's going in for uh, this routine surgery. So pray for your comfort for Bonnie. She has cancer in her bones and liver. I ask for prayers uh, for uh, everyone uh, who knows us and our family and everyone who uh, would have gotten to know the child. And we ask for help and mourning someone that we never got to know. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We us start out the congregational choice of hymns with hymn number seven and five. We can do all the verses.
verses 13 through 28. Uh, and these are some strange verses. They speak uh, to us as God's people and the roller coaster that we can be on in our journey of faith. At the very beginning, Jesus asks all of his disciples, Who do the people say I am? And they give all the answers, and they say, Well, some say John the Baptist, and some say one of the prophets, and some say, and some say. And the kind of answers that you might get today, you know, if you ask people who you think Jesus is, you get all different kinds of answers. And then Jesus says, But who do you say I am? And Peter says that he is the Son of God. And Jesus says, You are blessed, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, hell will not prevail against it. And I know that when Peter heard that, he had to be read pretty high. You know, he got a pat on the back from Jesus. They were going to be triumphant. They were going to conquer hell itself. And when I'd always heard the, the gates of hell, I would always thought of, you know, hell attacking the church. Uh, but when you think about it, gates are defensive. Gates are the last thing that you have before someone takes you over. And so it's the church that is coming to destroy hell itself. And the church that is coming to destroy Satan. That will sit with him in the judgment. And judge all of the evil and wickedness in the world. And so Jesus tells Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail. They will fall. Like Jericho, they will come crumbling down. There will be nothing left. And he hears this and he thinks, this is great. And he moves on. And a couple of verses later, things turn right around because it's Peter. And you have to love Peter if you read through all so now these back and forth. And he's talking to Jesus, and Jesus says, says to him that he will have to suffer. And he's going to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem he's going to suffer at the hands of the people that are supposed to be taking care of God's people. And he takes Jesus aside, and he has some harsh words with them, which is unheard of for a disciple to tell his rabbi that he's wrong at all, let alone to pull him aside and chew him out. And he says, Lord, far be it from you, this will never happen to you. And the words that Jesus has for Peter are harsh ones. He says, get behind me, Satan. And he doesn't you know, have some, you know, say, oh, Peter, you don't really understand the finer points here. Let's sit down and you know, reason it out. He says, get behind me, Satan. He equates him with the very being that tried to make God's people fall away in the first place. All over this issue of suffering. Because Jesus had to suffer and die. That was the plan the whole time. As we're here on this side of the cross, it's a little bit easier in hindsight to see what would have happened if Jesus hadn't suffered and died. Well, we all would be lost. Peter didn't know that at the time, but Jesus let him know, I have to suffer and I have to die. And then he moves on to say, and the church has to suffer. That's part of what it means to be a Christian, is suffering. That's what we look at in Lent. We look at Jesus' suffering, and we know that as we follow a suffering Messiah, that we suffer alongside with him. But it is not suffering in vain. It is suffering with a hope. Because when Jesus says that he would have to suffer and die, he follows it with and be raised on the third day. As we're in the middle of Lent, and as we're in the middle of any suffering, we look forward to the day when we will all be raised up to be with him. So as we look at the scripture, let's remember that we are going through Lent now. We are going through the difficult times now. It's the day that Jesus comes back. May it be today. And on that day, he will come back. He will bring his people. And we will sit in judgment of the angels that rebelled against God. And the gates of hell will not prevail against God's judgment. So if you are able, please rise with me. The reading of God's word. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
Whenever you loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and that he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Please be seated. short sermon yet, so. We've already seen that Jesus is victorious. Uh, I remember there was a, I was a youth pastor in a group who had uh, a kid who was just always kind of a pain, and uh, he was at a, a course with us, and he was usually just saying all these things that I had to explain to people, and, you know, it was kind of hard for him to be in there. Um, but somebody was asking him if he had seen certain movies, and they asked him, you know, have you seen The Passion of the Christ? And he said, no, but I've read the book. <laughs> it was the funniest thing he ever said. Um, we've read the book, and we know how it ends. And from this, we know how it ends. We know that Christ is victorious. And so, from the very beginning, we see that he's victorious. And as he's telling this to Peter, he's letting Peter know that he is part of his church and that he is giving the church, his people, the keys to the kingdom to go out and preach the gospel, to set free the captive, and to let people know that if you ask for forgiveness, Jesus will forgive you. And all of these things are so wonderful, but then as soon as he gets to the suffering, Peter does not like it. He does not like the idea of a suffering Messiah. But that's the only one we get. We get a suffering Messiah. And a Messiah that comes... Not because we are great, but because God is great and he loves us. And he comes and he suffers for us. And he suffers all things. And we follow after him. And if you look at the early history of the church, uh, they knew well what it meant to be a suffering church. There were horrendous persecutions. Um, there were Roman emperors uh, that would kill Christians for sport and entertain the citizens with it. Uh, today, if you are in certain parts of the world, nothing has changed. In North Korea, they are executing dozens and dozens of Christians. They know what it means to suffer. Here in America, we don't always have that same understanding. Uh, we suffer, but not in quite the same way, so sometimes it's hard for us to understand the suffering. You know, sometimes we'll speak up for our faith and someone will yell at us and we say, oh, I'm suffering for the gospel, but we know nothing in comparison to what the disciples knew, and the early church knew, and the persecuted church around the world knows. But it's not a matter of degree. We still suffer. None of us could suffer anything remotely close to what Jesus suffered, but he still cares for us. And I think that that is amazing. Now, if you've ever been going through something hard, and this, is, this has happened recently, but um, if you've been going through something hard, someone comes up to you with kind of, you know, a little whining in your problem, and you think, like, oh yeah, you have such a hard life, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, I imagine that that's how God could choose to feel when we come to him, you know? Jesus died on the cross for the sins of humanity. He bore the sin of the world. He was separated from God the Father that he had known from eternity after doing nothing wrong. His suffering is so much greater than ours. And yet, he cares about every little thing of ours. Every single thing that we suffer. 
He is here alongside us. He calls us to suffer, but he also comes alongside us to suffer. And calls us to do it for the sake of the gospel. And as we suffer for the sake of the gospel, the gospel is spread. Because people see what Christians are like when they go through suffering. And how they're different and how it's because God is with us. So I just wanted to ask everyone to think about what are the things that you might be called to suffer through. In America, we suffer not so much from persecution as wealth. And I think the wealth is the more difficult one to get through. If you're trying to persuade someone to come to your side, there are two basic ways that you can do it. You can bribe them or you can threaten them. And usually when you threaten someone, they pick up the resolve and they say, you can't threaten me, I'm going to get through this. But if you bribe someone, you know, sometimes they say, oh, well, this isn't so bad. I've got a little something coming in. And I think with all the affluence that we have here and all the, the freedom of our religion and all the material wealth and all these things that we have, we just kind of settle for all these things. And we settle for a life that is less than the kingdom. We settle for time that is filled up with entertainment. We take all of the wealth that we've been handed and we spend it on ourselves rather than spending it on spreading the gospel worldwide. We let things go. You know, we take things like the Sabbath and say, well, you know, the Sabbath would be nice, but my kids have soccer practice and they've got to do that. And when you look at those things, you know, and you think, well, what if, you know, what if this really was all handed out to me, this thing that I'm doing instead of the gospel? You know, what if your kid makes soccer and you know, goes on to win the World Cup or whatever it is, and they do all these things, but they never learn the gospel? And that's one person that was never reached. What if we spend all of our free time on ourselves and not outgoing and sharing with those that are in need and who need to hear the gospel? I can't imagine a thing that we would do with our free time in various to eternity. You know, there are all different kinds of ways that we are tempted. And the only ones that truly know those ways with us. So as we go through Lent, let's look at the ways that we are tempted to not suffer for the gospel, to not spend our whole lives living for God. But let's not let it be a guilt trip. Um, I know, uh, because one side is Jewish and the other side is Catholic. So I get it for both sides. Uh, the guilt trip is strong in this one. Um, Sarah and I were looking for wedding cake, so I was asking uh, the caterer about something. And I said, we need some kosher options. And she said, oh, you're Jewish? And I said, yeah. And she said, oh, well, you know, the guilt must be terrible. I'm Catholic. And I said, I've got it from both sides. So. <laughs> But I know it can be hard for us in our faith, you know, we can just see these things, oh, I'm awful, I'm awful. Um, and the answer to that is, yes, we are awful, um, but God loves us in the middle of that. He comes and he redeems us, and he doesn't call us to wallow in it. To repent is not to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, forgive me, please help me to change. So we look at these things, and we ask that to help us change in the ways that we've been selfish, the ways that we've been living for ourselves rather than the gospel. And we look forward to the final day look forward to what God will do through us. The people that God will bring to himself through the work that he's given us to do. So that on that final day, when Jesus comes back, he will come back. We can look back on the life that he redeemed in us and all the things that he did through us and say hallelujah. For the rest of time, we will praise God who saved us and redeemed us and all of his people. Please pray with me. God, though we deserve death from the beginning, when we first sinned against you, you promised in the very beginning of Genesis that you would come down and you would come to crush the head of the serpent and that he would crush you. That you would die for the sins of all of your people and you would suffer for us. Though we did nothing to deserve it, you would suffer for us. 2,000 years ago, you came and you suffered and you died for your people, but you were raised again. And so now we ask, as we have been baptized into you, as you have made us your people, that you bring us into that death and that we die to ourselves. We die to all of our selfish desires of our preferences and our wants and all of the things that try to tell us that I'm number one. And you give us a new heart and a new mind. You let us wake up every morning with the question, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I live for you today? How can I be a living sacrifice? 
We ask that you would turn us, one and all, to our purposes. You allow us to suffer together for the sake of the gospel. And out from this place, thousands and thousands and thousands of your people would come to inherit eternal life forever. And for that to happen, we ask that you would help us to identify all of those ways that we try to live for ourselves instead of you. That you would help us to repent from them and give them up, not just for Lent, but forever. And look forward to the day when we will be with you forever. I pray all of these things in the name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you please continue worshiping with me as we sing hymn number 327, The Old Rugged Cross.